we should be recording. Great. So I want to do a quick rundown, a bit of a summary from obviously uh, my point of view. Um, I'm uh, if, as long as Yuzan is here, I'll also ask him if he has anything to add on, on various ideas to various products. Um, but it's kind of a bit the rundown. Um, we're going to do it in two ways. Uh, first of all, um, I'll obviously show you always a bit on the website. Now, keep in mind, depending on when you're watching this video, um, it may be maybe in three months or something already, the website might have changed just slightly, but the general concept is, is going to stay the same. And so, and then I will always explain a bit the product. Um, I have a tablet here that I'll do a bit of drawing on to kind of visualize, um, yeah, uh, a lot of those things. So yeah. And then if there's questions, just please post them to the chat. Um, that makes it uh, very easy for me to see. And, uh, yeah, um, yeah, then I can uh, respond to that. So, um, I mean, starting out very straightforward, uh, when you go to our website, um, when we started cake, I mean, Yuzin and I, both of us, um, got into crypto relatively early using way earlier than me. Um, for him, it was 2009, 2010 so in the really, really early days for me, it was 2014 and, uh, yeah, until that point when um, we kind of got together and discussed what uh, kind of service, what kind of problem could a company solve for customers, until that point, crypto was 99% around capital gains. So it was all about either long-term capital gains, so about like long-term investing, or it was more about trading and speculation. And again, this doesn't go away, but this was what it was all about. And uh, in 2019, we were pretty much one of the first ones who then say, you know what, actually, we need to build an ecosystem in the crypto ecosystem where crypto pays cash flow, pays a dividend, pays an interest, whatever you want to call it. And so we then looked into how could we actually build this. And uh, Yuzen had already um, started a bit tinkering with a platform that would be able to provide staking returns. Um, again, this was super early stage. Um, at that point, um, Yuzen was uh, tinkering with uh, several ideas in the crypto space. For myself, um, I had just uh, left uh, my previous companies. I was also looking into various ways. I was looking more into the medical system, obviously also the crypto side, right? So tinkering and having a couple of ideas. And, and he already had something where he was like, you know what, probably the staking, this could be something. And uh, that is also why staking became our very first service. So when you look at our products here, staking is that very first service. And I want to um, explain that to you, how that works, um, why we added this as a very first one, how this works for customers, what do we do, and, 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 and these basic kind of principles. Um, I think from a customer perspective, of, or let's talk from a product perspective, um, Staking was very natural to be added as a first service because it is a blockchain native service. And that is relevant to understand because that means Cake didn't have to do anything other than go and connect the customer to a blockchain service. Whereas when we then talk about our second service, which was lending, there it became a bit more complicated because there we had to connect customers with institutional partners. And uh, yeah, so from a regulatory standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, um, that was just, yeah, very, very important. Yeah, uh, using posted that um, we actually had uh, people who are still here today who then uh, worked on other things in the meantime, and then came back. Uh, Kevin, Ivan, Genevieve, they were like really at the beginning, there helping with that code base. So um, yeah, that was uh, quite uh, um, yeah, a nice uh, journey here at the beginning. So let's quickly run this through what uh, is staking and how does this work for customers. And uh, yeah, that is obviously uh, something that um, maybe is nice to, to start off with. Um, to, um, so cake products, um, very first one, we started that um, pretty much Q2 2019, and that was staking. Um, to in any decentralized system so whenever you have a decentralized system the big question always comes who has a vote and in a centralized system it's very easy because it's the person who says i have a vote they have a vote in a decentralized system if anyone could just have a vote and the vote would be for free then the problem is that the person who sets up the most fake notes or who is the person who can just kind of scam the system by creating fake identities is the person who's going to win because that person can take over a an entire network and have uh, over 51% of the voting power. And in a cryptographic in a cryptographic system, this is so called a cyber attack. 
So in order to avoid such a cyber attack, you need to have some kind of a cost. And that's the absolute main thing. And so whoever has a cost has a vote. And Bitcoin, and that was actually Satoshi who had this genius idea in 2008 during Hall uh, on Halloween when he published his white paper. One of the major ideas there was that whenever you, uh, you proved, right, that you did work, so you had a proof of work system, and this proof of work costs, costs electricity, that's a cost. And so the more proof of work you show, the more voting power you have. And that is what's called mining. So mining is in the so-called proof of work chains. It has nothing to do with creating Bitcoins. It actually means you create voting power and it allows you to then show what a block in a blockchain looks like, right? And to understand a block is nothing else than like, which is full of transactions, right? And transactions are nothing else than the information. And these blocks get chained together to other blocks. And so that's how a block becomes a block chain. Um, so one of the very simple ways to have a cost is proof of work and that's mining. And obviously Bitcoin um, does that, uh, started that, defined that in 2008. And then the very first block was mined in on January 3rd, 2009. Um, so that's kind of how all this started. And then a bit later down the line, and I think Dash was the first one to introduce this. Maybe there was another chain. I'm not sure. Maybe using, you know, uh, who actually started with uh, a different cost model. I think it was Dash. Maybe Dash was just the largest one. Um, but basically yeah, there, a new cost it. came in. And that was the cost of so-called staking. POS, proof of stake. And staking simply means instead of voting by electricity, by doing work, you show that you lock up money, you stake money, you stake coins. And uh, the concept is completely the same as in mining. So in the person or whoever stakes coins gets a voting power, right? And then this person can vote what the blocks look like. Now, no one is going to pay for electricity. No one is going to lock up their money if there's no reward. And so there always needs to be a reward. Otherwise, people are not going to do that. And yeah, the reward is twofold. Um, there's always a cut of the transactions that these stakers or these miners get. And at the same time, there's a so-called block reward. And in Bitcoin, this is the so-called halving, right? This thing halves all the time. Um, and in staking, um, in DeFi chain, for example, or uh, in, in Dash, this block reward is doesn't, um, for example, in DeFi chain, it doesn't get halved every four years. It's actually a gradual curve every two weeks. This block reward goes down. So to look at this now from the miner perspective, right? So let's go look at the miner. The miner sees the following. The miner invests dollars to buy machines. So let's just make them like this. And they need to pay for electricity. So they mine, right? And the mining gives them Bitcoin as a return. But at the end, it's actually a function of investing dollars, buying miners, investing in electricity and getting Bitcoin out. And at the end, what miners then do, they normally, most miners actually sell this into dollars. Some miners keep it, but the majority. And so then you always look at what is the return that miners make? And there's an equilibrium. Um, of around that these miners make around 15% today. That's around. And so why is this? It's very simple because the at the end, the return depends on the share, your share of the total share. So for example, if there's 10 miners and everyone is showing the same kind of work, we call this hash rate, then everyone would have 10% of the share. But as soon as the price goes up, right? The Bitcoin price would go up then it makes it more attractive because suddenly the return would be going up. So people invest in machines and they invest in electricity because the return is going up. And so then it kind of balances out. And so most miners, there's an equilibrium on around 15%, more or less. If you look at the staker, the staker, there's a different view. The staker invests not necessarily dollars. They do to buy the coin, but actually they invest into coins. They lock them up. 
And so that's why so many people talk about proof of stake. And I mean, Ethereum pushes this obviously also heavily. Um, they say um, it's a, a greener model. It doesn't burn electricity. Now, I also want to make clear, um, staking is not as secure as uh, uh, proof of work. That's also, for example, why DeFi chain anchors on top of Bitcoin. So it borrows a bit of the security of Bitcoin. Um, you lock the coins. You can locking doesn't mean that you lock them for a time frame. It just means you lock them into a little box. And as long as this box is in there, you get a return. And so what you basically are seeing as a, as a staker, you see a return on your coins, but it's actually the exact same model as a miner. Um, obviously people always want to understand how much do they make, right? What is my return? But it's actually the exact same principle as in mining. It doesn't change. It's just because in one, you have this mining stuff and in the other thing you have the coins, but that's what people always care about. So let's make the example. Um, let's, for example, say per block, the blockchain pays out 100 coins to the stakers. So if you have 100% of the staked coins, then obviously every block you would be getting 100 coins. So that's very simple. It's unlikely that this is the case. Let's say you have 1% of those coins, uh, of the of the uh, of the staked coins that would mean that you get one coin per block and so let's just make this super super simple let's say you have staked 365 coins just for the sake of it right that's how much you have staked and that 365 equals one percent so actually there would be uh 36,500 coins totally staked but you have just one percent and let's just say, just for the sake to calculate easier, there is one block per day. Now, obviously in a blockchain like Bitcoin, we have a block every 10 minutes. Uh, DeFi chain has a block every 30 seconds. So there's obviously way more blocks on a daily basis, but let's just make this super simple. Then if this was the case and nothing would change, you have 365 coins, you're getting a new coin per block. There's one block per day. So you're getting one coin per day or 365 coins per year. So you could say, you know what? My APR annual return equals 100%. But there's a but to that. The but is you're not getting it at the end of the year. You can actually compound this, right? Because the next day, so that's on day one, you have 365. The next day you would have 366. Then you would have 367 and so on. So you could actually calculate a compounded rate. Again, the compounded rate is always a bit difficult to totally make it, get it accurate. It's a theoretical rate for the simple reason, because it shows what are the other people doing? Because at the end, it's about a percentage of the total, right? If no one else is compounding, sure, your uh, rate is going up. But if the others are not compounding, then uh, if they're also compounding, your rate always stays the same. And you'd actually be getting always because you add those coins and you have to add the coins. Otherwise, your share goes down. So it doesn't really go up. But this actually becomes a compounded return in theory, right? And this is called an annual yield. APY. So if you want to understand the difference, the return or rate is doesn't count for any kind of increase or any kind of compounding. Um, it's just basically a super dry calculation APR. And uh, yeah, it's basically based on how many coins have you invested? How many coins? And again, this also depends a lot on is this going to stay constant that you're getting a block a day and you get a coin a bit per day who knows there's all these things right so there's a lot a lot of variables so there's always the theoretical calculation but in theory then you could say oh i'm expecting 365 coins over the next 365 days i have 365 coins right now so my apr would be 100 percent in theory if i'm compounding and no one else does this my apy would be higher even right and so that is the view of the uh of the of the staker and in theory, you could do exactly the same here with mining, right? Again, mining used to be extremely profitable. Today, if you have free electricity, even if you have free electricity, mining can be borderline only profitable because the machines are actually getting so expensive. And yeah, so 
uh, again, um, I know that Yuzin in the very early days did a lot of mining. I never was part in crypto when mining was really profitable. Um, I, I think this is really something for large funds. But uh, staking is very, very interesting, especially if you hold a coin already, because, and now obviously this is the interesting part, in staking, you have cap gains, capital gains. So you, you benefit from the coin going up or down. And you obviously get the staking returns. So that makes a lot of sense. And so that is what the customer sees. And to finish this before I show you this on the website, um, what is Cake service? Well, in order to actually stake, just like in mining, you need to have a couple of things. First of all, you need to have the technical know-how. I mean, this is not that simple. You need to have a server that's online all the time. You need to be able to set this up. You need to have some technical skills. Now, is this super difficult? No, it's not rocket science, but let's say this way, probably 99% of the people will not understand how to do this, right? So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, even if you have the technical know-how, it definitely takes time because you have to service them. I mean, we have two or three team members who do nothing else than actually service these so-called notes, right? And we call these notes. Um, and yeah, so they have to service them. So it takes time. And the last thing is many, many blockchains, not all, but many blockchains have so-called master nodes that need a minimum of a lockup. And for example, in Dash, it is a thousand Dash. In DeFi chain, it's 20,000 DFI. So some people have 20,000 DFI and most don't. So all these three things together make Cake a very, very easy service as a, as a whole here, because basically what Cake does is it pre-funds a node. So for example, 1,000 Dash or 20K DFI. And then it puts it down into slices. We call these slices, obviously, because a cake, grab your slice of the cake. And it puts it down into slices and it allows people to buy those slices one on one. So if you want to get like one dash of a slice, you can use it with one dash. And there's no minimum how big these slices are. And in return, you are now getting a share of the rewards, right? You all automatically become a staker and the way these rewards are being split is 85% go to the customer and 15% go to cake. And that's how it's split. And so we sit in the exact same boat, obviously for cake, our interest is that the coin goes up in price because the coin going up in price means that the same return is suddenly worth more because the dollar amount just went up. And obviously at the same time, we want our customers to get a really, really nice return because we are getting 15% of those returns and we are, don't charge anything on the principal. And that is why we are in exactly the same boat with our customers. So that is when I say we want our customers to make billions of dollars. I that serious mean that because that means we're making 15% of that. And so that is obviously, um, yeah, that would be quite uh, interesting. Um, in all that. Now, I know at the moment we only have Dash and DFI. We are in the works. And again, this is uh, the tech team is uh, is going to strangle me when I say that. But we are in the works in the over the next couple of months or whatever timeline we have to add more and more staking coins. Uh, it's always a bit of a trade off between how much this benefits us versus how much work this is. So this is not one of our priorities right now. But let's say over the next 12 months, I definitely would love to see more coins here, right? I mean, there's a lot, a lot of staking coins. When we started, there was not that many. Um, now, uh, obviously, with Ethereum uh, going Ethereum 2.0, and then and there's so many coins you can stake now. Obviously, this gets uh, very, very interesting. And so that is a bit of a long-term vision here. Um, yeah, and so if you look here, um, at the moment, we have two coins. We have uh, DeFi chain and we have Dash. You can see here APY, obviously, so it's compounded already um, on Dash as well. Here you can see how many shares, how many slices um, we actually have uh, um, in, in total. This is how much is the total. This is how much would be available for customers. So they can uh, see that and they can see how often is the payout. So everything is completely uh, transparent. And what we do, what in my opinion, to my knowledge, you know what a company actually does is we actually show all the various nodes uh, with all the addresses and uh, yeah, all the 
the details here. So this is extremely transparent and we do this yeah, for all the, the coins. So that's staking. Are there any questions on that? Um, use it. anything that I uh, forgot to mention here? Anything you want to add? I, I haven't spoken about the freezer yet because first I want to go into other services um, and then I'll uh, talk about that. Okay. Great. Then uh, let's go into the second service um, that we added in uh, Q2 2020. And uh, that's lending. Uh, lending was added because at that point, um, mainly Bitcoin, which I mentioned is proof of work, right? So you cannot stake it. Uh, you would have to do mining. Uh, also, Ethereum back then uh, was only mining. And uh, obviously, dollars, in this case, stable coins. For those of you that don't know what stable coins are, stable coins means um, there is a backing by a company that promises, and you have to trust that promise, right? And again, um, especially Tether, many times very questionable how good is their promise. Uh, USDC is, uh, uh, is the US dollars backed by Circle. Coinbase is also part of that, um, a bit more trustworthy for many users. But so basically, instead of trading dollars, you trade tokens that represent those dollars. And uh, they always called USD and then some ending depending on whatever firm is doing this. You will also find, for example, BUSD, it's from Binance, or there's PAX, uh, which is also another stable coin. And so obviously, um, Bitcoin, Tether, dollars, very, very big kind of market, but you cannot really uh, get cash flow from staking because this doesn't exist. So we do this uh, via lending. And uh, the returns are way lower in that um, than staking. Um, and I want to run you through how that works. So a bit of a different model. Um, so that's number two, that's lending. And uh, the way this works here, we started this in Q2 2020, and that was actually the model that got us cash flow positive. So that was the key. So the staking, um, also when you look at our user numbers, I mean, it was quite exciting for people, but at the end it was not super revolutionary. Um, so that, it, that the real key that really got us cash flow positive and really kind of got us traction was the lending that we started about a year afterwards. Um, it, we had to solve a couple of things from a regulatory standpoint, and I'll walk you through with those. So obviously one of the key regulatory things is we don't want to be an exchange. We want to be a technical custodian. We want to be a technical facilitator. And, and that is very important. Um, on the lending side, there were a couple of other issues. For example, a, a concept uh, called you don't want to be a fund manager. So the person always has to be actually in charge. So the person takes the financial risk. The person um, has to be the decision maker. So everything there, it's not that we go and we make decisions for the customer. And that's very, very important, all of that. Uh, so how does this work here? So the people have Bitcoin, ETH, or USD in form of stable coins. Um, they use Cake as a tech intermediary, but the funds actually are still responsible by the customer. So we just forward that. So that's Cake. And we forward that to institutional partners. Um, and uh, in this case, it's uh, Sparrow. They are a large partner here in uh, Singapore, and they are actually backed or they have an insurance by Cigna. Very, very large here, um, owned by the Far East family here. So very, very large. And uh, basically the idea here is, um, and one thing we're going to work with them is to get way more transparency for our customers from their end. This uh, was also something that we always wanted to have um, so that customers can actually see what's happening. But what is happening, let me explain it to you, is they then go mainly to exchanges. And this is something that happens in stocks as well. You could do this with Tesla. You could do this with Apple. You could actually do this with any share, uh, with, with, with anything. Um, you could even do this with gold. It doesn't matter. It's, oh, it's a very prominent, like it's a very uh, well-known uh, cash flow strategy. Um, and the way this works is um, you kind of use this for two things. You lend this to either people who go and use leverage and your part is always used as the main principle. So in theory, and that's key in theory, your fund should never be lost. Um, it's, and again, it's very, very unlikely as ever happens. Um, on top of that, we have an insurance that makes sure um, the funds in this unlikely scenario do get lost. They actually have to step in. 
but it's very unlikely it ever will. That's, uh, for example, because you need to have margin. And so if you've ever done leverage trading on exchanges, you do need that kind of margin. And the other thing is um, they use this for short sellers. So short sellers borrow that. Um, and so that is uh, how this then works. Um, and so these are these people, whenever if ever you have done leverage or short selling, you pay a commission to the exchange. Um, the exchange takes their cut and then pays a commission to these super large aggregators. Um, and then they pay a return to the customer. And then obviously here, cake takes our cut. Now here, the cut is way, is way more uh, variable because it depends on um, actually weekly returns. So every week, every Friday, um, we actually settle those batches, right? And this is run in batches. Um, mostly Ying and Bettina has uh, have to do that. And so every week we actually get a return from them plus appetite. So how much do they want? So it's not different to staking. Here, um, everything happens from Friday, always four weeks. We do have four batches. So actually a new batch starts every week, but it always goes four weeks. Um, and there's always a, a cap. There's an appetite um, because they say, you know what? We don't need more than that. Um, exchanges are not asking for more than that. And uh, the, the return fluctuates. It goes up or down. And if the return goes up, we don't always forward that to the customer. We just take a little bit more or the return goes down. Then we just make a smaller cut and uh, we still try to pay the same amount to the customer. Um, just every once in a while, I think in our entire history, we had to adjust the rates twice. So we always try to do this really well, but sometimes the rates go so low for such a long time that we cannot cover those, uh, those losses. And then uh, we just have to lower the rates. Uh, we had this uh, beginning of August, 2021, where we actually had to lower rates, um, not because uh, we wanted to, uh, but really because uh, there was just no option uh, for us. Um, obviously on the lending side, um, it's a bit different to the staking side because here it's not the blockchain that generates those returns. Um, obviously it's the entire system that does that. It's the same as in stocks, right? So in, if you were an interactive broker, said you could do the exact same thing. Actually interactive brokers asks you if you want to do that. Um, you could either do this as a standard or you cannot. So either where you just lend out these, uh, your stocks. Um, there is always a super slight risk, right? That the exchange screws this up and your funds are gone. To be honest, the risk is super, super, super tiny. On top of that, we do have Signum in that case, Signum Capital. But at the end, the customer has a bit of a different risk uh, in comparison to staking. Um, that, that One has to say that. Um, one key thing, we do call both products low volatility though. And the reason why we call them low volatility is because there's always only one coin involved. And you will see what I mean with that. Um, in both products, um, the lending risk is super, super, super tiny. It's not zero, but it's super, super tiny. So actually sometimes in with some of the size of the blockchains, right? One could discuss is uh, Dash, for example, as a blockchain um, is staking there safer than lending Bitcoin simply for uh, adjusting certain risks. So uh, I actually think it's very, very similar in that sense. But one reason why we call both products here low volatility is because you always have only one coin. And in theory, you get your principal back. Um, if you put in a Bitcoin, you know you're going to get your Bitcoin back plus a return. Yes, in dollars, this thing might fluctuate, but the coin itself, you know you put something in, you will get the coin back plus a little bit on top. And it's the same on Dash, it's the same on DeFi chain. So the calculation here is mostly towards dollars. You don't have to worry so much about the actual, like getting fewer coins back. Um, this is very different in the third product that I'll talk about, but just for the kind of general sense here um, so that you understand that. Um, so a bit different here on the lending side, uh, it always runs four weeks. Um, we are looking into having a so-called running rate. Many, many platforms do that. At the end, they still have those batches. They just don't show them to their customers. There's way less transparency that way. And so when you look at other lending platforms, be it BlockFi or Binance, um, they're way less transparent. And there's a lot of criticism there as well. Um, also from regulatory side, you can look at BlockFi. BlockFi just recently got into major trouble from a regulatory standpoint. Um, we should be relatively safe in that regard uh, because we're extremely transparent. We tell our customers everything. Uh, we tell them how everything works. Um, and we want to add here additional transparency that Sparrow and Signum uh, actually show way more where the funds are, what the funds are doing, 
um, this should give quite a unique insight for customers. Um, this is not going to be something that I'll have ready tomorrow, but uh, we actually have a, another meeting with Sparrow about that next week to, to really increase that. Um, adding more coins here is a bit more different than on the on the staking side. So I would probably be a bit more hesitant in adding more coins here uh, for the very simple reason, because it always needs a partner. It always needs someone to help out. So yeah, that's just kind of a bit of a idea here. Um, let me just see if there's any questions that I want to answer or should answer. Okay, nothing. Good. Then, uh, yeah, let's just quickly look at the website so you can uh, see what this looks like. So here at the bottom, for example, you can see the, the batches and, uh, yeah, you can see the returns here. So, yeah, and uh, people can actually read all the details here, um, yeah, for all their the questions with examples and so on. Um, any questions on that? Cool. Then uh, let's go to service number three, and that's the newest service. And now we go to a high. Um, yeah, so good question from uh, Ian. Why did we call it Lapis? I'm not sure. Do we still call it Lapis? Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't see the term anymore. Um, so very early on, uh, there was always this discussion on what should we call this, uh, service and, and how should this actually work? And, um, we weren't sure if we should call it, um, uh, lending or what, how does it actually work? Um, and, um, using then came up, uh, with this, uh, uh, cake, uh, cake lapis idea, uh, which is like a layered cake, very popular in the, in Southeast Asia. Uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, I really don't like it. I still remember the first time we got it and, and it was like, okay, I definitely need to try this. And I was like, oh, okay. Don't really care about it, but that's just a personal, uh, kind of story. Um, so the idea here was that we are layering all this. Um, and so that's just, uh, where the entire name came from at the, at the end, um, it really confused people more than it helped. And, uh, people just got really confused about the entire, uh, concept there. So. Um, at the end, we changed it and, and just became a bit more clearer um, over the last year. Uh, sometimes some great creative ideas that you start off with, um, at some point you realize, okay, it's uh, confusing people a bit more than uh, anything else. So, yeah. Great. With that, let's go to service number three. And that is the newest one. And that is liquidity mining. And now here it gets to a high, volat uh, high volatility product and it gets a bit more complicated. So I'll um, explain that in a second, but before I do that, I just quickly want to show you those tabs here at the top. So you understand those as well. And then we go into this uh, third one, and then I'll also run you down a bit on what's coming up. Uh, it could be obviously that you're watching the recording of this and we already have those newer services or that some of these things have changed or new coins have, uh, have been added. So just kind of keep this in mind, depending on when you're watching this. Um, one idea has always been that we offer customers who are extra loyal, um, who commit using cake for a longer period of time to actually um, charge them less than the 15%. And so we call this the freezer, right? I think you get it like cake, cake put your cake into the freezer. And so um, we allow that to do that up for the next 10 years. And actually, if you are staking, um, the blockchain actually has an additional reward if you, if you freeze for five or for 10 years. Um, so that's actually on top. So you actually make extra money for staking for five or for 10 years. Um, so, um, freezing, you can use this for liquidity mining and for staking. Um, you can freeze, you get, it's the same service. So nothing changes. It's still staking and liquidity mining, but, um, you just get more because cake takes less of a cut simply because we know you're going to be a more long-term user. Um, you can freeze in various uh, tenures, um, starts at one month and it goes all the way up to 10 years. And so here you can see the calculation and you can see the differences and you can see the, the benefits of that. So um, I can highly recommend to at least freeze always for one month. You can stop the freezing obviously after this month anytime. But um, the reason I think because you really get immediately a higher return and yeah, many times actually taking some emotions out of your investment uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's very unlikely that you need to take decisions right away. Um, I, many times it seems like it, but most of the time it's actually the long-term view 
who wins. So uh, we have a lot, a lot of people actually freeze for 10 years, uh, but I would always recommend to freeze at least one month. It takes a little bit of the emotions out of everything. Um, that's just a bit of a personal idea. Um, yeah, so that's that referral system. I think very straightforward. Um, I don't want to click on it because then you'll see my dad's detail. He's my only referral that I have. So, um, but the referral system, I think is super straightforward. Um, it uh, just means you have a code and people can send that to, to people and uh, they will get a bonus when this person actually signs up. But at the same time, uh, they get a cut on our profits. So we share some of our profits with these people. Um, it only works on one layer. So it's not a multi-level system. It's just one level, a typical referral system, very popular. And I also want to be that honest. It's the most efficient marketing that we have. It's definitely something that I want to really focus on and, and drive because we've had amazing success, um, with all of that. And then uh, last but not least is the, our VIP program. You can just look it through. Um, again, we have to update that, uh, that section a lot. Um, it's actually, we just want to give you additional incentives. It's very self-explanatory, seriously. Um, so no need to spend too much time on it for me right now, um, where the more funds you have with us, the more you use our services, the more additional benefits we give you, like an exclusive Telegram group, and uh, you can have free withdrawals, and uh, you get an extra helpline, and so on, and so on, and so on. So very, very straightforward, I think. Uh, not so much. Uh, I think the bigger question is always a bit of the freezer. Uh, referral and uh, the VIP program, the confectionery program is, is quite self-explanatory, to be honest. Um, great. So let's go into liquidity mining um, because that's going to be a bit more on the complicated side. Let me just see if I missed anything. Um, yeah, might be a good idea to have this uh, a bit uh, clearer hidden, Ben. I agree. Um, great. So let's talk about liquidity mining. And now it gets a bit more complicated. Um, it also gets very, very attractive because suddenly now you can actually make 60% on your Bitcoin versus 6% in lending. But uh, just keep in mind, now we're talking about a high volatility product. And the reason why it's high volatility is because if you put a Bitcoin in, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a Bitcoin out. Even though you get 65% annual return here, um, the reason here it's return is because you cannot automatically reinvest. Um, and you'll understand that also in a second. So that's why there's APR and not APY here. So let's quickly run this through here in this rundown. And uh, let's talk about this uh, third one here. So number three, it's liquidity mining. And we started that in, I think, Q4 2020, maybe at the end of Q3, but definitely Q4, I'm not 100% sure. And uh, that definitely also had a big, big, big impact in all of it. Um, if I look at what I call the seven functions of DeFi, decentralized finance, um, the very first function that a financial system does is it creates value. Uh, it creates money. It, it just creates value. And in my opinion, Bitcoin is very dominant in that, right? So it's very difficult here to compete with Bitcoin. So again, I would probably not want to invest in coins that try to compete with Bitcoin. But that's just a personal opinion. Um, obviously, many, many other coins try to do the same, but I think that is really the winner here. Uh, the second one is the transfer of value. And at the end, you will see it's always about value. Um, we could say that Bitcoin is that. I'm struggling a bit with that if it is actually Bitcoin that, uh, that does that. But you could say that at the end, it doesn't really matter. Here, it's basically not investing into the coin. Here, you're investing in the, into the consensus algorithm because you suddenly take part in that, right? So it's either you invest into mining or you invest into staking. And so at the end, that is um, a function that you can do at Cake. You can actually buy Bitcoin, but uh, you cannot do that with Cake. We use a third-party service. I can show that to you because I'm a, I have a Singapore registered account and we exclude that in Singapore, but it's very self-explanatory. So we allow you with external partners to actually buy coins. So we tick that box. So on Cake, we allow you to participate in that first function of DeFi, which is basically just buying crypto. Uh, the second one is we allow you to participate in the transferring of value uh, via participating in staking. Um, so quite straightforward. Um, the next function that's very relevant when it comes to um, DeFi is obviously lending value. We allow you to do that as well uh, by lending. And so you can see already the order here, right? So let's go to function number four. 
and that is exchanging value. Now, exchanging value is also something we have. Um, instead of um, centralized exchanges like Binance exchanging value, um, it's actually the blockchain that does that. And uh, again, always here, the key thing is um, Cake is just always providing a technical feature. Cake doesn't create the, doesn't create that service. It just provides access. Um, and I know that sometimes it only provides access to one blockchain, but over the next two or three years, you will see that we will actually be very blockchain agnostic. We want to add several blockchains on, on Cake. It's not only DeFi chain or it's not only Ethereum. We want to add the Binance system. We want to add the Cardano system. We want to add Polkadot and we want to add Cosmos and blah, 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 blah. So we want to offer all those seven, uh, like, probably six at the beginning, because the seventh is very questionable if it will ever be created. You will see in a second. But we really want to offer that to our customers, blockchain agnostic. That's very important. Um, exchanging value is also different from transferring value. Transfer is just a one way, so it's A to B. But in exchange, it's A to B and B to A, right? So that's relevant, and I'll explain that to you in a second. But just to kind of have a bit of a preview, there is the concept of tokenizing value. And we're not talking about centralized tokenization, what stable coins are doing. So you lock up a dollar and you create a, a, a dollar stable coin. We'll talk about decentrally tokenizing value. And that's something um, the team is actually working on right now. So I'll make a wave here because depending on when you watch this video, hopefully we have this tokenization of value live. This will allow Cake to have stocks and commodities like oil and blah, 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 and gold and so on. So this is going to be absolute breakthrough. And the key thing here is this is not storing a Tesla stock and then creating a Tesla token, because that actually makes you um, a security platform. So this makes you highly regulated. But here it's about the blockchain doing this, which is completely different. Um, and I'll explain that to you in a second. Um, then it's about predicting value. So obviously a lot of futures markets, option markets. These are also things we would love to have, not this year, but probably next year. So um, this is coming in 20. 22. So this should be here, end Q3, beginning Q4, 2021. That's predicting value. And that's obviously really, really crazy. Then uh, futures platforms, options, all decentralized on the blockchain. Very, very nuts. Uh, the last is identifying value, or it could also be reputation of value. And here we actually get into the entire concept of decentralized identity. Very big question mark here if this will ever get created. Um, but if you look at the actual entire financial system, right? So you look at banks, this is what actually banks do as a whole. Nothing else, right? Banks make money on those seven things. Uh, banks make money, banks charge you, and they charge you for, for creating that money. There's, a, there's always an interest. Uh, they, they charge you for transferring money. They charge you for borrowing money. They charge you for exchanging currencies. Um, they obviously make money as the broker when you want to invest in stocks. Uh, they make money as being the, the, on, uh, the prediction centralized party. And obviously they make money because they identify reputation. They identify you. They can give you a good standing, a bad standing. And in all of that, they always make money, right? And so if you actually think about it, DeFi, and many people forget that Bitcoin is also DeFi, um, just very basic DeFi. It's maybe it, it's definitely number one uh, one function, maybe number two, but it cannot do any of the others. Ethereum then came in to really kind of say, you know what, we want to do everything, um, not only DeFi but also NFTs and so many things. And it's very questionable if DeFi if, if Ethereum is really perfect for DeFi. It's definitely a great blockchain, but it's just so general purpose that many times people forget. Um, is it really smart to have something so general purpose? But if you think about it, actually, it's those seven functions that make up the banking system. And so blockchain just came in and said, you know what? Let's disrupt all those functions. Again, very questionable if they can actually do the seventh, but it doesn't really matter, at least the first six. Let's disrupt all that. And uh, Cake is not creating services in there, but basically being an aggregator, a, a marketplace to put all those functions on the platform, provide people with cash flow, provide them with making money, and then Cake takes a cut from that. Um, yeah, and so what I want to explain to you now is a bit of this one here, number four, and kind of preview number five, and just give you a very tiny glimpse of, of number six, just so you have a bit of an idea. Um, and then in case 
um, we would ever have those first six perfect, um, you could in theory somehow provide people with an identity via the blockchain. So suddenly people uh, may have a chance in the future to say, you know what, I don't need my passport. What I really need, I'm just going to give you my profile of my DeFi status um, on the blockchain. And based on that, that is my financial standing. That is my reputation. That is the, the skin of the game that I would do, right? And so that's just very theoretical. Again, a lot of question marks here. This would be very futuristic as a whole. Um, let me just open the chat because maybe on this one, there's now a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> wrecked <fi. laughs> Yeah. Um, heck, fi. Oh, that's also funny. Um, okay, so let's talk about this, uh, this exchanging value. Um, so that is now here liquidity mining, and let's uh, explain this first. Um, normally, you have a centralized exchange, for example, Binance, and you have user A here and user B, B uh, here, and uh, there's an order book. And one person makes a, an, uh, an offer and the other person accepts based on that order book. So someone uh, makes a bid or the other one makes an ask. Uh, the, other, the one person says, I want to buy. The other one make, uh, makes a sell. It's always based on the order book and you can take that or you can offer. Very traditional. At the end, uh, the sex always makes a cut. Um, the thing is here is this, it, it's relatively efficient. It's definitely fast. Um, it's relatively cheap, actually, even though there is a cut, but it's relatively cheap because these, uh, these uh, centralized exchanges actually go down with the, with the prices sometimes uh, relatively far. So it, it can be actually super cheap. And sometimes these, these centralized exchanges don't charge anything for a certain period of time or um, they allow you to use their company token to get a, a better rate. Um, but there's obviously one key thing, and that is that, and that's actually why a decentralized system, that's the only advantage, let's be honest, that's the only advantage a decentralized system always has, and that is that of trust. So decentralized systems are slow, they're inefficient, and most of the time, they're actually more expensive than companies. I know many times it doesn't look that way, but a decentralized systems, uh, like advantage is not being cheap. Uh, it's it's actually always more expensive. It's just that decentralized systems can charge so much that these decentralized systems always look so cheap. But in theory, um, there will always be a, a, a small fee for a decentralized system has to because there needs to be a cost. And this cost can be hidden. It can be a transaction fee. It can be inflation. There's always a cost in a, in a decentralized system. Otherwise, that system is not going to work because you would have a cyber attack, right? There needs to be a cost. Um, in a centralized system, um, they can make something free because they charge something somewhere else. Um, again, there's also a cost, but the cost is very different. Uh, best example, Robinhood, for example, right? So Robinhood goes and says, oh yeah, you can trade for free. You can do it super efficient. You can do it cheap. You can do it fast because we're selling your data to other large market makers who then trade against you. But in, in theory, you trade for free on our platform. So again, centralized systems will always win on those three. Decentralized systems will always lose on those three, but there's this major, major, major intermediary, and that's trust. And that is huge. Some systems, right, especially decentralized, obviously they also go because they are open, which means they allow for things that centralized systems don't allow for. Now here, there's always obviously the question, um, is this like compliance wise helpful or not helpful? Is this rather spur criminal activity or is this gonna help? Um, for example, whenever we had decentralized social media, uh, people always thought, oh, this is fantastic. No one can censor it. Yeah, but at the end, a lot of uh, child pornography was on there and a lot of activity that was hate speech and that was racial. So many, many times that thing is a bit of a, a question mark if open is actually really the good thing. Um, again, I'm a someone who, who who likes to have little regulation and who likes to have open markets, but it's not actually proven that uh, this is going to provide a better user experience as a whole. Um, probably at the end, some kind of mix is, is helpful because uh, I think we all can agree that um, no platform or there's absolute zero, zero, zero value in child pornography. Actually, it's it, it's absolutely disgusting and hurtful and, and illegal, um, but that is not even the moral side of that story, right? So there's very little and um, kind of 
advantage here. And in crypto, many, many times this happens very similar. Um, many times um, activities that would not be allowed in centralized systems then get started in open systems, in decentralized systems, and people see this as an advantage. In some small parts, it actually is, but many times actually illegal activity happens here. So that's why I always make a bit of an, a question mark. And illegal to me is not always from a legal standpoint, so it's also from a moral, um, um, yeah, from a big question, what kind of moral standpoint. Um, many illegal Ponzi schemes, for example, um, work on open systems um, simply because they cannot be shut down. Uh, but the main advantage for me for a decentralized system is this trust factor. So you don't have this centralized party. Um, the very famous one with Mount Gox that actually caused the 2013 crash um, cost, uh, came from there. And obviously, whenever there's a centralized system, um, there's always this, this trust aspect, right? So that's key. So how would this then work in a decentralized system? Um, in a decentralized system, the big problem is um, as soon as you try to create an order book, um, it actually is centralized because someone needs to control that and run that order book. And having that on the blockchain, it could in theory work, but it would be extremely inefficient, extremely expensive, extremely slow. So people wouldn't really kind of run this route. And so it actually, the DEXs started relatively early. Um, it, 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 it was just never really efficient. Um, and then uh, Uniswap was actually the first one to come up with this idea and everyone thought this was crazy and then it was absolutely genius. And the idea behind it is that you create, you have people who create a so-called liquidity pool. And a liquidity pool is always a pair. So you have a left side and a right side. And for example, on the left side, you put in Bitcoin and on the right side, you put in DFI. And whenever someone puts funds in, you start with a certain percentage, right? It actually doesn't matter with what percentage you start, but let's just say you start off with the percentage for you put one DFI in, uh, one Bitcoin in and 10,000 DFI, and you always have to work in pairs. Whenever someone wants to add liquidity, so you add liquidity, you have to use the same pair percentage, the same ratio. So you could do 0 0.1 and 1,000 DFI. But you can't, you could not do, you can, but then the system automatically adjusts it and you lose. So people don't do it. And we actually automate it um, that you cannot use a false ratio because it would actually, you would actually burn the higher side. So it would actually be uh, absolutely destructive. So you would always use the same kind of ratio. And now the interesting thing is the following. The price of the DEX is not an order book, like in a centralized exchange. It's actually the ratio that's in there. So in this case here, the price of Bitcoin, one BTC equals 10,000 DFI. Or to say it in a different way, one DFI equals one over 10,000 BTC. And so now comes the interesting part. If you think that, for example, DFI is extremely cheap here, you could go and you could buy DFI. Now, how do you buy DFI? Well, by actually using the DEX, not by adding liquidity, but by actually using the swap function. And instead of adding on both sides, you just add either on the left or on the right, and you get the other side. So if you think, wow, one DFI here is super cheap, then you would add on the left side at 10,000 of Bitcoin, and you would get one DFI out. And then if you, again, so now what would happen is here on the, on the right side, you would be missing one DFI. And now on the right side, there would be a tiny little amount of Satoshi's more in there. So you may still say, oh, wow, DFI is still cheap. Okay. So you add another DFI. Oh, it's still, uh, you, you add a, you add a little bit here on the left side. Oh, you get another DFI out that was relatively cheap. And you could do this until at some point, And we call this the pools are balanced again. And so what are they balanced to get against? Because they're always balanced. Well, they're balanced against other platforms. For example, Texas or actually other Texas. And so they become balanced. And so what you actually have, you have a lot of arbitrage traders who actually balance those pools. If you just had a single pool, 
a pool would always be balanced because you just had a single pool. But because you have other centralized exchanges and other DEXs, these DEXs can be unbalanced. And then you have arbitrage traders that come in and pick one side. Now, a pool actually is always slightly imbalanced, but many times it's so tiny that you can't really benefit from it. And so now the question obviously is, what are the economics in this entire system? Well, you have for a decentralized exchange, you have basically two parties. That's all it takes. It takes first the so-called people that provide liquidity and we call them liquidity miners. That's why liquidity mining. And you have the person who actually uses the exchange. We call that person the swapper or the person using the exchange, whatever you want to use it. So obviously both of them have do something and they want to have an incentive, right? So let's first start with the swapper. Well, the swapper has two interests and they can be at the same time or they can be either or. The first one, the swapper wants the other coin, right? So the person has Bitcoin and wants DFI. The person has uh, Bitcoin wants Ethereum. The person has dollars and wants Bitcoin, whatever, right? So it wants the other coin or that person just wants to do arbitrage. So yes, he or she also wants a little bit the other coin, but at the end, he just wants to arbitrage. Now, that person has a benefit because obviously he's he or she is getting this out of the pool. So there needs to be a cost to that. And what is the cost? Well, the cost is very simple. There is a exchange cost. Um, I can't remember using uh, corrected me last time when I explained this to the auditor. What do we call this? I call this a transaction cost, but it's not uh, commission. Uh, what do we call commission. This? Commission. Zero point two percent commission. I can't hear you. Um, maybe it's, I can't hear you, hear, but I cannot hear you. Maybe it's just commission. Me. Can you write it in there or can anyone else hear you? And I can't. Uh, is it my mic? Okay, we can hear him. Sorry, then I'm the, uh, something on my audio is not good. Commission. Okay, so this person pays a 0.2% commission. And so obviously the question is, where does this commission go? Well, obviously there is a second party. And that second party, just like before stakers and miners, they get two things. They get the commission. The commission can come in either pair, right? So they can come in either, in this case, Bitcoin or DFI. They can come in either pair. And the liquidity miner can also get a block reward. Now, obviously that block reward always comes only in one coin. So generally speaking, liquidity miners cannot compound automatically like stakers because generally there's always one coin that dramatically this uh, liquidity miner gets more than the other coin. So they cannot automatically like compound. That's why in liquidity mining, there is an APR and not an APY. Um, what we offer, for example, on cake though, is that people can stake DFI automatically that they get from liquidity mining. Um, they also get always a little bit Bitcoin and or DFI or ETH and DFI or Tether or USDC um, and so on for the very simple reason, because there's also this commission. Now, again, question for everyone, where does the return come from? Well, it's the blockchain that creates an incentive for people to provide liquidity. So it's actually a fee that everyone in the blockchain actually bears. It's a cost again, that everyone bears in order to run that DEX. And so people need to kind of counterbalance and say, yeah, it's worth it for me or it's not worth it for me. And so at the end, that's where the reward is coming from. And uh, yeah, so that is, uh, yeah, I think a very elegant solution how DEXs work. And that is exactly what you can see here on our website. So you can see here, um, this is the Bitcoin DFI pool. It pays 65% per year. And you can see both pools. And one thing that you can actually see is, and that's what Cake does, it automatically checks how well is the DEX balanced versus other centralized exchanges. And so you can see this here, right? And so that is a really, really nice comparison with the ETH DFI and the USDT DFI and the Litecoin DFI and so on, right? So it is a really, really nice kind of uh, balance here and, and, and comparison. Um, and you can always see the, the pool that's in there. Now, Obviously, there's now one thing that is important, and that's, uh, let me just open the chat in case I uh, forgot something here. Um, let me go into the tablet again. 
there's one thing that is important here, and that is why we call this a high volatility product. We talk about a pair, right? We talked about the BTC DFI pair. And let's say this pair starts out with one and 10,000. Now, just imagine you're the person and you say, you know what? Um, this pair pays 65% APR. Great, I'm getting 65% on my Bitcoin. I'm getting 65% on my DFI. Obviously, this is being paid out mainly in DFI. You can then swap those DFI back to Bitcoin. And there's always a little bit of BTC paid out as the commission. That's not the volatility. The volatility comes now from this. Imagine you want to add liquidity and get your returns on there. The key concept in all of the liquidity mining, and that's how everything is being kept track of, is what is your percentage of the entire pool? So it's about pool percentage. You don't actually own coins, you own pool percentages. So in this case, it, now there's two BTCN and 20,000 DFI, you own 50% of the pool. In this case, also 50% of the rewards. Now, very unlikely that you would ever have this, but just for the ease of explaining this here. Now, let's just say there is a, a swapper now, right? That swaps like crazy. And what that person basically does is that person puts in a lot of DFI. For example, that person puts in 20,000 DFI. Now, the way the function works is putting in 20,000 DFI doesn't give you all the Bitcoin on the left because you're basically adding 100% of the coins on the right you would actually be getting 50% of the left side. So the person would be getting one BTC. So the person is actually not having a very good exchange ratio, but let's just say that person wants that. Now, what happens after that swap? Well, very simple. Now there's only one BTC in there, but 40,000 DFI. So that's BTC DFI. And now say you wanna exit the pool right now. Why? Because you need money, okay. When you exit the pool right now, you're having 50% of the pool. You don't have actual physical coins. You always talk about pool. In this case now, you would be getting 0 0.5 BTC and 20,000 DFI. And so now here comes where that so-called, and this is now a term called IL or impermanent loss. And that's where the volatility comes from. This bucket here that you're getting out plus the rewards you are getting, right? You always get rewards. Don't forget that. That's why you're doing this has a dollar value. And that dollar value needs to be compared to what you actually put in. And again, it should have, and in most of the times, this dollar value here is higher than the one that you put in. But again, there's no guarantee on that. And so even though everything is working fine, right? So if staking works fine, if lending works fine, I can assure you, you get more coins out that you put in. I don't know if uh, the dollar went up or down, but I can tell you for sure that you get more coins out. In liquidity mining, even if everything works fine, everything works completely correct, I cannot assure which of those decisions made more sense. Did it make more sense not to join liquidity mining and the one BTC and 10,000 DFI, even though the price might have dropped, right? Again, the price might drop. I cannot promise you that this number here is higher or lower or the same than the number that you're getting out. Most of the time it does, and that is why people do actually liquidity mining. And with most of the time, I'm talking about 99%, but there's always this small chance that what you're getting out is actually a lower part. And that's what's called an impermanent loss. It's very, very, very difficult to predict if you have an impermanent loss. In general, you can say if the price of coins moves apart significantly, there's a higher impermanent loss than coins that move together. Because when coins move together, then it's, uh, yeah, there's, it's just not possible to have such a dramatic loss because then it's very unlikely that dramatic exchanges happen. And that also causes that large pools of coins synchronize because there's such a high interest for people of those coins to keep the pair stable. And that is actually a reason why the pool of DFI and Bitcoin 
is actually so synchronized. And that is the reason why BTC and DFI actually trade so well together, because there is such a large pool that actually makes like provides people with a penalty for these coins to move apart. And so, um, yeah, that's just the explaining here, the explainer here. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, when people provide this liquidity, they get uh, their return, hopefully their return plus what they put in outperform, uh, yeah, outperforms what if they had stayed with the original in 99.9% .9 of the time it does, but we can't guarantee that. And so that's why we call this a high volatility product. And that's also why you get really high returns here, because here you're getting 65% on your Bitcoin and you're getting 65% on your DFI. And so, I mean, that's insane. That's like 10 times more than you're getting normally in your Bitcoin. So for example, when people come to me and I get asked this literally on a daily basis on Twitter, on Instagram, I have BTC and DFI. Should I lend BTC and stake DFI or should I put my BTC and my DFI into liquidity mining? And the only answer to give here is it really depends on your volatility tolerance. That's what it comes down to. Because in lending and in staking, if everything works fine, which I expect, you're going to have more BTC and you're going to have more DFI afterwards. If liquidity mining works as intended, I cannot promise you if you have more BTC and or more DFI afterwards, even though everything went fine. And the reason is very simple because of that impermanent loss. And that is just important to understand. But in return, right, there's a flip side to that. In return, you have way more return on your BTC. So maybe the best solution is to do both, right, to, to have a bit of a mix. And so that is, I think, important or, or relevant to understand in all that. Any questions, anything I left out? Because then let's do a very quick preview. And that's what we're going to finish with. So let's talk about when we scroll up here. So let's talk about, so basically uh, the decks here, exchanging value, that's live. So let's talk about that tokenizing value and predicting value. So let's talk about that next function that's coming out. Um, so that's product number four, and that's tokenization. Tokenization in its purest form means that you have a token and generally that represents something, mostly in the physical world. Many people call this also stable coins. So tokenized tokens are for many people stable coins. Now you can actually create stable coins on anything. You can create stable coins on the dollar. We have that. You can create stable coins for gold. We have that. But you could create stable coins for anything out there, also for stocks and so on. So now always the question is, how do you make sure that the price of the token actually represents the physical thing? How do you do that? Well, the easiest one is you do it centralized. And you do this by actually putting dollars or the stock or something, you put this into a vault and you, you say, look, I proved to you that I have a billion dollars. So I'm going to create a billion tokens and at any point you can come to me and you can give me a dollar and uh, a, a token and I'll give you a dollar anytime. Right? So it's very unlikely that these tokens ever fluctuate away from a dollar because why would they, if the price would be too high, people would immediately sell them. Um, simply because they would make a lot of money uh, in the dollar. If they were too low, they would immediately buy them because they know they would go back to a dollar. At any point, they can actually get the physical dollar for it, right? So they would actually arbitrage it. So that is the first option. Again, we have the same tools, right? It's super fast. It is efficient and it's really cheap. And it actually is super cheap. And people, again, don't believe that. But if you look at, for example, USDT or USDC, People don't pay anything to uh, have that, right? I mean, they are pretty much free. You can transfer this for free suddenly, right? So it's actually very, very, very powerful to, to see that. But again, it always comes down to one thing, and that is trust. So it always trust. So the question is, can you do this decentralized? And again, there was, I think Maker was the first one to actually do it. Um, they made a decentralized US dollar, 
which is called DAI. And one DAI should be one US dollar. How do they do it? Well, instead of locking up the physical thing, like a dollar, you have to lock up something that is worth more and that is on the blockchain. And what is that? Well, obviously it's another cryptocurrency. For example, ETH. And so what Maker said, you can create a vault, you put one ETH in, let's say just for the sake of argument, ETH is 1000 US dollars, let's just make it simple. And for that, you are allowed to create, again, let's make it simple, half of that in actual US dollars. So what happens is, since this ETH is $1,000, you can create 500 DAI. And this is how DAI is created. In order to get the ETH back, the ETH is stuck in that vault, you need to fill in the DAI again. So since these ETH are worth $1,000, there's a very high incentive to always put those 500 DAI back because you would get actually $1,000 out. Now, there's obviously a couple of questions here. So the first question is, how can you create pressure to force people to always pay it back? And that is where something called a stability fee comes in which is actually nothing else than an interest. And so the first thing you need to introduce is an interest. And that interest depends on a lot of factors. It, it's about economics here. Um, it, it, you always need this interest. So that is always pushing the, at, at the end, it always pushes it that you want to pay back because you need to pay back more and more and more in order to get your ETH out. And the other thing is you need to have a price oracle because the blockchain needs to know how much is that ETH worth on centralized exchanges? Well, it's worth $1,000, but the blockchain doesn't know that, right? Because as soon as this $1,000 actually drops below the level of what you're borrowing out, the vault has to dissolve. It has to take away basically 500 DAI and give an ETH back. It has to dissolve that. And that's what the price oracle is in charge of. So it needs those two things, price oracle and a stability fee. If you have that, you can actually create a decentralized token, decentralized tokenization for anything. This can be obviously for currencies, but this can also be for stocks. This can be for bonds. This can be for commodities. This can be for precious metals, so metals and anything else that trades on public markets, anything. The powerful thing here is it's completely backed by the blockchain. There is, there are attack vectors, but you can kind of kick them out. For example, one attack vector would be, and there have been massive problems with that, is the price oracle. Obviously, if you manipulate the price oracle, then obviously you can completely destabilize the entire system because if you then suddenly tell the price oracle, hey, ETH is not worth $500,000 anymore, now it's only worth $300, obviously all the vaults would start to collapse. And so what you always wanna have is you wanna use several oracles. And so when you hear David talking about like all these various companies that we work with, NASDAQ and so on, it is because all these companies provide price oracles in order to make sure that we're using an average for all those prices for all of that. And so now the question obviously comes, um, how does this work and why would someone invest in them or what is the incentive in all that? Well, so far you have not seen that, that much incentive because if you, and now comes the interesting part, if you, for example, lock up DFI and or BTC, you can, you're going to be able to do it with both. Yeah. Let's say you lock this up and you put it into a vault and let's say there's a thousand dollars in there. And then let's say you create a Tesla share. At first glance, you still have your DFI and BTC. So your long DFI BTC, obviously, right? Because you still own them. They're still in the vault. But now you have a Tesla share. Let's discuss what actually you want with the Tesla share to happen. But first you pay an interest, right? You have to pay an interest in order, like you put a little bit of Tesla share, you take Tesla share out, but you have to pay a little bit more back. So there's always a pressure to at some point pay that, that, that back. But what you're really actually doing, you're hoping that this Tesla share is actually going down in price. Because what you definitely don't want is that that Tesla share 
goes up and is worth more than your vault because then your vault basically gets dissolved. So the first thing that you're doing, if you actually create the share, is you're actually shorting whatever you're creating. So shorting means you're betting that this thing goes down. And you're long, so you're betting whatever you put into the vault that it goes up. So now obviously the question is, why would you do this? Because um, maybe you don't want to be short Tesla. Maybe you, you're okay being short gold, but maybe you don't want that. Okay, now comes the second part. Just having a, a share is boring. There needs to be a platform to exchange that share. And so now we have a DEX. So on the DEX, for example, there's a USD Tesla DEX. And there is liquidity mining on there. So now suddenly the entire system that we have built and that everything comes together is suddenly coming together here. Because now suddenly, let's say the Tesla liquidity mining can be insane. It's a, it's a supply and demand. You could be making 300% APR, 300% per year for creating Tesla shares. So you put them in here. Now what happens? Well, someone can put dollars in here, right? Puts dollars in and gets a Tesla share out. So now the dynamics change a bit. Why do the dynamics change? Well, first of all, whoever holds this Tesla share here and does liquidity mining with it gets massive cash flow. So that's obviously super interesting already. Massive cash flow. Holding Tesla 300% APR. Insane. At the same time, this person is long Tesla. Right? So very, very interesting dynamics. Another person is short Tesla but has also put it into the liquidity mining pool. So now you're wondering, how is this possible? There's not two people here in the liquidity mining pool. Okay, let's think this through. What would have happened if it was really only two people and no extra Tesla share? Let's make it simple. Let's say the Tesla share is worth $500, just to, to make this simple. Then this person would have put in $500 and one Tesla share. So let's say that person wants to buy a Tesla share. Well, he actually can't buy a single Tesla share because that's everything that's in the deck. So you would have to actually put unlimited amount of dollars in to get one Tesla share out. So that's not possible. Let's say this person adds $500. Well, he's doubling the left side. So he's getting a half out on the right side. So now he has half a Tesla share. So let's look at the decks and now it starts getting its own dynamics. And now it starts getting super, super, super interesting. Suddenly here, there's a thousand dollars here on the left side and a half Tesla share on the right side. Holy mucko. Someone is able to sell Tesla shares, half a Tesla share for $1,000 here. Whoa. So as people are gonna see this and they're like, holy shit, I need to create Tesla shares. Why? Because I can create one Tesla share in the vault for $500, but on the decks, they're actually worth twice that they're way more worth so i can actually sell the tesla share on the decks and i make a net profit and so what's going to happen in the entire ecosystem is that the vaults and the dexes uh, and the decks and basically all the price are going to find an equilibrium and it's going to find a balance and it's going to balance it out and so what we're going to offer at cake we're going to offer exactly that liquidity mining part. That's what we're going to offer at Cake. We are not going to offer that creating on Cake. And we're also not going to uh, allow the decks on Cake. But we will have an easy forwarder where people on the Cake website have a forwarder. And that is why. I know there's so many puzzle pieces and you're watching this and you're like, holy crap, there's like you're using the mastermind signing all that. We have the light wallet here that allows obviously the very easy access. And so cake can stay the tech platform that is basically a custodial wallet. And now this is really important that does not allow buying, selling or trading but only stores that, which from a compliance standpoint is going to be so disruptive in comparison to all these other platforms out there. And then we basically can integrate here and allow people a very easy access to a third party tool, similar like how we use Banksa or Transac 
for fiat. And people on Cake can get cash flow, and they can, if they want to create vaults via the Light Wallet, via the DEX, they can do the DEX very easy. And now suddenly people can get access to stocks, precious metals. They can get insane returns on that. And for those that are the experts, they can actually start playing around with the vaults and the de and on the DEXs. And so that's what we hopefully have on the platform end of Q3, beginning of Q4. And just to kind of finish this, and now I'll look into the questions because I assume there are a couple of questions. Um, you can then put another layer on top of that, right? And that's next 2022, and that's prediction markets. So now you start putting the exact same things. You start putting pools of bets on other pools. Completely decentralized. And so this entire discussion that people have around Binance is not allowed to offer like futures anymore or options anymore, or the the, the SEC is gonna try to stop that. It's impossible to stop that because it's actually happened on a DeFi chain, right? It's completely independent of Cake. Cake only goes and says, hey, you know what? You have a token that is a bet on where Bitcoin is in six months, you cannot buy this, you cannot buy, you cannot sell this, and you cannot trade it on Cake, but we allow you to store it on Cake. And if there's any benefits attached to it, you get them. And that's now suddenly the prediction markets. And then if you kind of put this all together, it is insanely disruptive to what anyone out there is doing. It's super disruptive to any bank, to any fintech bank, to any new bank. It's disruptive to Robinhood and so on and so on and so on. I think most people just cannot even grasp the entire understanding of that. It's going to be insanely value bringing, in my opinion, to DeFi chain. And that is why it is so important to make sure DeFi chain is 100% decentralized, right? It's not allowed to have single points of attacks. And I know there's still room for improvement there. I get it, but I think we're doing really, really well already, but it has to be hundred percent. And then at the same time, it's about this easy user platform on cake. That's just going to blow everyone away. Great work on that user. The APY, again, um, you will see that all these layers at the end are stacked on top of each other, right? So that's where it gets really like everything that we did, I mean, had a bigger mastermind picture behind it. It needed the lower level for the next one, for the next one, for the next one. And that was really important to understand in all that. So hopefully by the end of 2022, all those functions from one to six are like super smooth, are like all over and completely centralized and that would be um yeah uh, really great uh will it be possible by stock tokens directly on cake or do i go through the decks and withdraw the cake so you will have to go through the decks but it will be similar to how banksa works so that means um in banks it's actually very similar you instruct bankser to buy bitcoin with your credit card and then deposit those bitcoin onto an address. Where this address is, banks that doesn't care. It's the same on the DEX. So you instruct the DEX to use dollars or DFI to buy a Tesla share, and then you instruct it to deposit to an address. If you remember, that's always when you go into the DEX, you actually see a deposit address. It's exactly the same thing. Just here, this deposit address is gonna be populated with an address that you control on Cake. It's exactly the same thing. So you don't have to do two clicks. It's still two steps. It's still a swap and the deposit, just like on Banksa, but it basically is auto-populated. Decentralized by internet lockdown. Ooh, I think that's a really far stretch, uh, Ping Lai. Um, I mean, 
using all already writes, it's in, indistinguishable, the traffic. I mean, there's a lot of people who analyze, could you block certain ports? Um, could you do certain things? My answer to all of that at the end is, like, I think that's such an unlikely scenario because you're causing so much collateral damage and you would cause so much friction with people that I don't think regulators would have to go this route. I think regulators would rather go and, I don't know, pin down on exchanges. Look what's happening. There's a reason on why I always focused on not being an exchange. I saw this coming in my past company already three years ago. And I was always someone in my past company who said, I don't want to go this banking route. This is going to kill the company. And at the end, that's what exactly what happened. I think the key thing here is not being an exchange. I know it sounds super counterintuitive, but that is what's going to make cake win over the long run. That's what the regulators doing. Regulators are pinning down on exchanges. It's going to go more this route. And I don't think they need to block traffic. They're going to go and 99% and of all decentralized decentralized projects actually centralized. And I think the regulator is going to pin down on them. And uh, that's at the end, what's going to make us win. Um, Peter, the DEX on Cake is the DeFi chain DEX. Um, in the future, and that's also something that's going to come, we're going to be integrating many DEXs, right? But no DEX is going to be built by Cake. So we're going to go and, and, and look at on Ethereum, what DEXs can we integrate? We look, we're going to look on the Binance Smart Chain and see, hey, can we integrate DEXs there? Um, obviously, DeFi chain DEX and so on and so on. So the key thing is, once we have built this entire ecosystem in one flow, we're going to add tools from other systems that really work well. At the end, my vision here for, let's say, 2025 on Cake is completely blockchain agnostic, access to any kind of DeFi tool out there on a simple to use platform. And I still believe DeFi chain is going to be the largest winner out of all of this, simply because it's so targeted towards its use case. But in 2025, DeFi chain will be just one of many, many blockchains that Cake is going to be centered around. Um, and that's absolutely good. I mean, that's absolutely fine. It's good for DeFi chain. That's great for Cake. So that's going to be the, the long term vision here. Correct. Makes absolutely no difference. Um, in terms of rates, um, Cake is going to charge a small um, handling fee, just like it does on Banksa. Um, I don't know, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2%. Um, it's definitely not going to be like a, a massive amount because it's actually a market rate, right? So the reason why we are charging 5% right now is just so people cannot arbitrage. But in that case, they cannot arbitrage anyways because it's actually the DEX. So there's no way to arbitrage. So we're just going to charge a small handling fee just because, I mean, we should. We are providing a service. Um, but at the end, it doesn't matter if, you, if, if people want to use it themselves. Uh, would DeFi chain network transaction fee, the absolute amount, adjust to the market price, higher market price, lower absolute amount? Um, I'm not being like, I don't, I'm not 100% sure I followed a question. Um, at the end, the transaction fee on any blockchain is always a bit of a supply and demand. So the more people want to get their transaction information into a block, the higher fee they're willing to pay. DeFi chain was always designed to not, to very unlikely, say this way, ever have high fees just because of the way it is designed. And again, it makes some sacrifices in return, right? And some of the sacrifices are that it definitely, like it, it wants to use Bitcoin as, a, as, a, as an anchor layer, um, just to kind of be extra sure. And it uses proof of stake instead of proof of work. And there will always be a certain criticism to that. Also a certain praise to that because DeFi chain doesn't use as much electricity. Um, it's always a trade-off, but um, yeah, um, that's kind of the, the idea here. Um, yeah, Cake is a bank without being a bank. I think that's really important to understand. So, um, I mean, I would love for in 2025, people really say, hey, wow, I can do everything I can do on a bank on Cake, but Cake should never actually be the bank. Um, they should, it should always be the intermediary. And then maybe at some point, right, we can really make it even more trustless for users that they have, I don't know, certain tools or certain access points, even with a ledger, with, with with additional features for them, where yeah, we can we really we, we always need to provide maximum transparency to our customers. Obviously, we will have always a certain amount of of custodial ship. It's impossible to give that away, um, but 
the more transparency, the more security, the more we can give to our customer, the better. And I hope, um, yeah, that is a route that we can always go. Um, we definitely don't want to get a banking license. Um, as soon as we do that, we go the exact wrong route. Um, because we would uh, actually fall exactly for that same trap that so many companies out there fall for and then they lose. Um, the goal is to do the exact opposite. The goal is to have to assure the customer that every dollar that customer deposits with you, or every Bitcoin is there, right? And that is key. At the end, that's what you want. Um, that's what's really relevant. On the other hand, it's important that we don't onboard any criminal customer. We don't want to onboard money launderers. We don't want to people with illicit activities. And that's super important. But anything beyond that, I always believe a Bitcoin, a customer deposit is their Bitcoin. And as long as that Bitcoin was acquired legally and is used for legally like sound reasons, we should not like actually block a person from using their money. Nothing pisses me more off when I want to transfer money in and or out of a bank and the bank asks me, what do you use this for? This makes no sense. And a blockchain actually allows that, right? Because you have blockchain analytics. And so that's the beautiful part. So to me, cake could disrupt banking in a way how banking should have always been designed. And I think that's the beautiful part where I would love to see our company go. Yeah. Cool. But I hope that explains to you the products we have. It explains to you a bit of the, let's say the next 12 months. And I hope it explains to you a bit of the next five years, um, the vision on where this should go. Right. And that's what this video is about. And uh, I mean, hopefully um, when you watch this video in three months, we are a bit further. And hopefully when you watch this video in six months, uh, we are already way further. And hopefully when we ever watch this video again in 2025, we're like, man, we outperformed this vision by so much. We, what small thinkers were we? I think that would be so beautiful if uh, we could ever do that. Um, yeah, and I'm really, really confident that, uh, yeah, that, that actually we can go that route and we can do that. Um, we have been talking to lawyers in Singapore and in the US about the legal feasibility of all that. And so far, all our lawyers have signaled that this looks really good. They want to see always uh, um, wireframes. They want to see the signs on what the product actually look like. Um, can everyone become a lord? Um, everyone except for you, Kavi, because you are what you are. Uh, what's the what are you this lower? lower tier and Earl. Oh yeah, right. So you're stuck there. Everyone else can. Oh, a dude, right. A dude. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No Lord for you. You'll stay an Earl. Um, but, uh, yeah, that is, uh, and, and that is a really key thing. I think from a legal and compliance standpoint, um, from today's perspective, we're doing well. I think everything is straight. I think from a product standpoint, I'm confident in delivering. I think we have a way in, in acquiring customers. Um, do we know every step along the way over the next five years? No, we don't need that. But I'm very confident that our team is so strong that whatever crossroad we get to, we're going to figure out what decision to make to not screw this up, but to actually get further ahead. Definitely very cool. Um, yeah, very much looking forward. I hope that explains it a bit, a bit of the vision, a bit of how all this started.